I was elected. The judge was appointed. After an Ontario judge said Doug Ford's plan to immediately slash the size of Toronto's city council went against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Ford wasted no time striking back, invoking the rarely used Section 33 of the Constitution, the notwithstanding clause. We're taking a stand. If you want to make new laws in Ontario or in Canada, you first must seek a mandate from the people. The clause allows federal or provincial governments to pass laws even if they breach the charter. It was an Ontario first and provoked furious reaction. This is unprecedented and it is not acceptable. You're not the king of Ontario, Mr. Ford. We're uh, disappointed by the uh, provincial governments uh, in Ontario's uh, choice. And despite the criticism and the chants from protesters on the outside and chaos inside the legislature, Today, the fight continues. Toronto City Council now plans to challenge the bill in court. So why use the notwithstanding clause on this specific issue? Does it set a precedent for other premiers, other provinces? At issue is here to talk us through all of that and more. Chantal Ibaya is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Quebec City tonight. And Althea Raj is in Surrey. Good to see everybody. I know you've all been writing about this, thinking about it, tweeting about it. So let's start with uh, maybe a simple question. I don't know. Chantal, uh, was this the right thing to do? Is this why the notwithstanding clause exists? No. Uh, sometimes uh, some things are gray. This is not a gray area. This clause, an escape clause from the Charter, uh, is, is something that you use in really grave circumstances. There's a, a reason why it was so seldom used uh, since 1982. Uh, you don't suspend rights at the whim of, of and, the, and the rule of law at the whim of wanting to do something faster rather than slower, which in this case uh, is really what is happening. Uh, Premier Ford can reduce the size of Toronto City Council. Mm -hmm. No one is stopping him from doing that. The court is stopping him from doing it in the middle of a municipal election. That's a completely different proposition. So it's not about jurisdiction, Andrew. It's about when you do things. Do you think there's any argument here that the premier could make that this makes sense, that he does have the mandate to do this? Oh, there's an argument that would be very uh, congenial to a lot of his followers. A lot of conservatives have never really made peace with the Charter of Rights. And some of them have been quite anxious to, to use the notwithstanding clause, not just on occasion, but quite regularly, hmm. uh, to prove a point, to establish the supremacy of Parliament as they see it, much as the way that the uh, government of Quebec, the PQ government, used it to prove its point about the, you know, the, the rights of Quebec versus the federal government. So it it's definitely has a following. He's not doing this uh, completely out of the blue. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us have never been particularly keen on the notwithstanding clause in principle, would rather it wasn't there. Some others, uh, Chantal would, would mention that, you know, would say, well, it's okay to have it as a safety valve in extreme circumstances. And I guess those of us in the first group would say, how can you be so naive? If you leave a, lo a loaded gun lying around, somebody's going to pick it up and shoot it. If you leave this kind of power within reach of elected politicians, they're going to abuse it. And uh, it was only a matter of time, and you only needed somebody like, Don like Doug Ford to come along. And Althea, do you think that he has made the case convincingly that this is, this, that this is justified? I think he's made his case to his followers, but I wonder how many other Ontarians feel like this is the appropriate action. I mean, it's really clear that this isn't about policy. If he really wanted to change the size of Toronto City Council, it would be much more uh, realistic and less chaotic to just wait until the municipal election is over, introduce legislation, and reduce the size of council, which is what this is supposed to be all about. But instead, by launching this kind of grenade, he's basically accomplishing three political points, I think. He wants to dare, I think, think, the Prime Minister to take him on, uh, and Mr. Trudeau has decided not to do that. But it's a way of uh, doing a sort of David and Goliath battle. He wants to send a warning shot to all the critics who might think about using the courts to thwart his electoral agenda. He's not going to be, uh, he's not going to hesitate to use a notwithstanding clause. Uh, and as Andrew rightly pointed out, you know, a lot of conservatives not just view the notwithstanding clause as something that's there to be used, but it's also a way to like stick it to the liberal judges. And this yeah. is something that I think is very popular with some parts of the Conservative Party. So this how is do the we guy, by the way, yeah, go ahead, this, Andrew. Yep. This is the guy, by the way, who is launching his own lawsuit against yes. the federal government to, to knock down the carbon tax. So he's not so he doesn't yes. have too much trouble with knocking down uh, legislation passed by elected well, officials when it suits his purposes. And that's the case with the notwithstanding clause general, of course, is it only applies to some sections of the charter. 
courts have been knocking down government laws for decades on division of powers grounds. Uh, and nobody said boo about that. None of the parliamentary supremacists had a problem with that. It's only when it gets to these individual and minority rights clauses that suddenly the supremacy of parliament becomes the, all, the be all and the end all. Okay, so Chantal, speak a little bit about what uh, Althea alluded to there, and that is the federal government's response, which the prime minister today was very clear. I'm not getting involved in this, and and I I think you know Althea is probably right. This is what Doug Ford maybe wanted as a nice byproduct, but is it the right response from the federal government? Okay, l l let me first rewind to Andrew's point about leaving yes. a lying gun and someone will shoot with it, uh, because it does need this lying argument to, to be picked up and, and maybe shot at. Uh, I don't know how many premiers uh, we have had multiplied by 10 plus prime ministers since 1982, and this is the first time that someone uses this clause in this cavalier fashion, for lack of a better word. So I would argue that, by and large, it is preferable to treat Premier Ford as the exception rather than some sign of a rule. Uh, that is one. Is the Prime Minister wise to uh, say I'm not getting involved in that? He does have a constitutional power that he could use to disallow the provincial law. It has not been used since 1943. I'm not sure that it has not fallen into disuse, but if you were going to test it and you were a federal government, because it's a huge precedent to disallow from Ottawa uh, a piece of legislation, I think you would want to do it on an issue other than a disagreement over the size uh, of the Municipal Council in Toronto. One last point, it may be that Premier Ford is miscalculated, he wants this to be I'm cutting off politicians and people in downtown Toronto, and I've got the people on my side. But yeah. it is veering into a debate over the charter. And the charter has uh, more support among Canadians than just about any politician in this country. Uh, Althea, I, I agree with uh, yeah, uh, Andrew, and then Althea, and then I'm going to change topics. Go ahead, Andrew. I agree with Chantel that we're unlikely to see them using disallowance. I'm not so sure I agree that this, there's been you know, rare instances when people have used or contemplated using the power uh, in uh, not particularly responsible ways. The government of Alberta used it to try and get out from under the uh, uh, same-sex marriage, which wasn't even yes. provincial jurisdiction. Yeah. They contemplated using it, quite seriously, to exempt themselves from lawsuits from, pe from mentally handicapped people who had been forcibly sterilized in the past. Uh, and who knows how many other times people have tiptoed up to the edge of using this and yeah. drew back at the last minute. They will be much less likely to draw back now, I, su I suggest, after Ford has established this precedent. And that's what really worries me is Ford himself has said he's going to use it repeatedly. And who, many, who knows what other premiers are out there going, who are going to follow his example. Okay, I'll see you on that. Yeah, and I'm at the NDP caucus, and so is the reason why I'm here. And uh, the NDP today proposed that uh, there should be a, a committee of experts that gets together to decide what other options are available uh, to the government. Now, there aren't actually that many options, and Chantal is right, she mentioned disallowance. A lot of people actually think that that power basically no longer exists because it hasn't been used. But the court could, pro the federal government rather, could ask the Supreme Court to weigh in on this issue. And is this the appropriate use of the notwithstanding clause? And perhaps in light of Doug Ford's threats, we need to have clarity on that. Okay, I want to switch topics because the House is coming back uh, next week for the beginning of the fall sitting. The Prime Minister, they're also having a caucus uh, in uh, Saskatoon, the Liberals, and so the Prime Minister gave us a taste of some of the things we can expect. It did sound very election-y. Here's what uh, Justin Trudeau said today. To Conservatives, empowering women, reducing inequalities, fighting climate change, or investing in infrastructure simply aren't part of their priorities. And perhaps, worst of all, They'd rather use the politics of division for quick electoral gains. It was probably the sharpest uh, attack that I've heard in, in some time on the Conservatives from the Prime Minister. And I guess the strategy is we're going to make Andrew Scheer Stephen Harper 2.0. Uh, is that what we should expect this whole fall sitting to be about, Chantal, to be about now campaigning, positioning, uh, and trying to shape narratives around uh, the leaders? I'm not convinced. Uh, if this sounded like a bit of a broken record, it's because you heard that speech and that attempt uh, at the last Liberal yeah. convention. So it was kind of a rethread on a familiar theme. I don't expect that uh, framing leaders is going to dominate the next uh, four or five months of sitting because there are so many large federal provincial issues and Canada-US issues looming yeah. uh, that uh, I, 
I think that sounds like the prime minister pulled an old speech because he had too much on his plate to prepare something new. <laughs> okay, Andrew, what are you going to watch for then in the months ahead? Well, to pick up where Chantal left off, there are these three big, enormous uh, files on their plate, none of which they particularly handed well. One is NAFTA, one is the carbon pricing thing where they've got their own January 1st deadline to meet, uh, and the more provinces seem to be jumping off that train by, with each passing week. Uh, and of course, the pipeline uh, uh, exploding cigar that they're dealing with. Uh, and I, you know, you can you can have any agenda you, you think you want to pursue, but events have a way of intervening. So they're yeah. going to be dealing with that. I will say the Liberals may have some fun in, in back, in going back at things by raising issues that are likely to make the Conservatives uncomfortable vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Maxime Bernier's new party when we find out what it's called. Uh, that, that there will be issues in which the Conservatives will be uncomfortable perhaps raising much of a feisty opposition to the Liberals on it and which Bernier will be quite willing to plow into and that, that would be fun for the Liberals to see then. Althea, what do you think we should watch for? Yeah. I would just add to Andrew's list cannabis, which is going to be legal on October 17th, which is seems like it's going to create a bit of chaos in a number of different jurisdictions as uh, there doesn't seem to be a smooth plan <laughs> rolled out. Um, I think that the Harper 2.0 thing is something yeah. that Liberals have been harping on for a while, but when you look at what's actually in front of Justin Trudeau and what the government needs to do, they're at risk of acting like Stephen Harper on certain things. Like if they've lost, you know, PEI, maybe New Brunswick, uh, Alberta is no longer longer on board on this climate plan. Uh, Jason Kenney, I'm if he sure comes in, Doug Ford, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Exactly. You know, all these individuals are opposed to his plan and here mm -hmm. he's going to appear like he's heavy handed and dominating and get his, getting his agenda through without that bind that he promised during the yeah. 2015 campaign. So that Harper 2.0 thing can work against them too. Uh, Chantel, I'll give you 30 seconds just to push to what you think we should watch for this fall because I didn't really let you answer that part. Uh, the, the, uh, certainly, uh, the, the Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline, uh, I would add Indigenous uh, yeah. agenda issue. It seems to be a really big one. We don't know what's going to happen to NAFTA. And yes, we will be watching for those by-elections that uh, the Prime Minister will be calling that would have the leader of the NDP run in BC and the NDP try to hang on to the Outremont riding of its yes. former leader. Big uh, moments for the NDP there. Okay, we've got maybe a minute. I'm going to do something that you all hate. Well, I know Chantel and Andrew hate doing these kind of games, but I'm going to make you do it anyway, just to bring me joy. What do you think will be the topic of the first question when question period resumes next week? Let's assume Justin Trudeau's there on Monday. I'm not sure that he is. Andrew Scheer gets up, or um, Jagmeet Singh can't, but uh, whoever gets up to ask the question, what, what's the topic do you think that uh, dominates? Chantel, you get to go first. I think Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, both the opposition parties have positions on the issue and, and points that they think they can score off the Liberals. I'm saying that uh, thinking that there won't be a major decisive development on NAFTA between now and yes. when the House returns. Okay, Andrew. Uh, I would guess the Conservatives will ask about Dominic LeBlanc's uh, ethics issues because that's always fun and easy. Uh, and perhaps the NDP will ask about Ford and notwithstanding because they're trying to present themselves as, the, well, they are the real opposition now provincially in Ontario. Very quick. I, I agree with everybody and I think NAFTA. Lot <laughs> and lots about NAFTA and supply okay. management. I am uh, the best part of asking those questions is I get to hold on to them till next week and then and then mock you uh, when you may or may not be wrong. <laughs> before, <laughs> thank you all. Before we go, be sure we to subscribe. All be right, it's a long QP. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> be sure to subscribe to at issue the podcast edition for extra content this week. We are going to talk about the NDP and how the party is preparing for the year ahead. Althea has been out there for a couple of days. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website cbcnews.ca/slash/the-national.